Hey students, fellow learners, uh, welcome to week one, our kickoff week and our first lecture together, one of eight. This week our focus, um, as you will see in our syllabus as well as in the online module, is discipleship and the story of God through repentance. Uh, your reading this week, hopefully you've already begun that, is from Blevins and Maddox, chapters 1 through 3, and Gauss' uh, introduction, and chapter 1. And so I'm going to talk to you kind of as, as a summary of some of those elements uh, and some points that I noted that hopefully will help us as we begin. Uh, this week's reading is, is not only enjoyable, um, but it is also very foundational. In fact, specifically, uh, as you look to Gauss' introduction, some wonderful um Pentecostal language, uh, theological uh, definitions, you might would say, of some core words and in, into our beliefs, our, our theology specific to uh, salvation. And so these should actually be great uh, tools for you, not only in this class, but also as you share uh, things with your congregation and with those that you lead, uh, often phrases we don't use, especially with the depth that um, is golf rights on those on. So hopefully you, hopefully you will enjoy those uh, as, again, great foundation. So that introduction is not only a part of your specific um, reading assignment, it is a wonderful tool for you. It's one of those places that you hopefully will come back to. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, as we look to Goss's writing, by title of this week, as well as much of his writing, revolves around the word repentance. Uh, repentance is a very much a foundation of our understanding and our beliefs into salvation, but it is a very important thing that you and I must understand as we have read the text to the elements of discipleship, and, and I believe uh, Goss points out those in many respects. Um, as he begins to frame this, he speaks of the understanding of who God is, uh, the character of God, and he deals in for a period of time on the glory of God and the majesty of, of God's glory and how that relates to repentance as you read through. And I thought it was a beautiful way to express that, but also a deepening understanding of, of this need of a holy God and our need of his not only salvation, but this heart of repentance that would take upon the character and nature of God. Um, he spoke about how God's character shapes our understanding of not only our need to repent, but also shapes our life to desire the image of God. And often, if we're not careful, uh, from my uh, circles and where I see particularly America at in the church, is we preach and teach a message of salvation um, that isn't very repentive. And even if it brings in elements of repentance, it certainly is not uh, repentance into the lack of the image and character of God. It is, I messed up, uh, I have sin, and maybe I'm sorry for the sin. But Goss really talks about how this repentive heart, has, um, or I believe he talks about how it should shape our understanding and our desire to pursue the character, the image, and the nature of God in our life. Not that we would be God, but yet we would take upon his nature, the morality, and such that God is. And so I think that was kind of interesting. I also think that it, again, enriches uh, our teaching, our preaching, and our ability to communicate to those who are lost and those on their journey of discipleship into what God is inviting us into. And so uh, it takes it, again, from sometimes just a, I'm sorry I got caught repentance to a truly godly sorrow uh, that we have wronged our uh, creator and that he is inviting us to walk in his image and to take upon ourselves the character that he exhibits. Um, God's grace is talked about in this, not only again for the element of salvation, forgiveness of sin, but in shaping his image into us and how that process emerges. Um, the infinite glory of God. He writes, any substitution for this God, our creator, our God of glory, any substitution for this God is idolatry. Any reduction of his glory is sacrilege. Any desecration of his name, his word or presence is profanity. That's found in pages 12 and 13. Without the image of God and the image of his glory, we cannot fully see the need and the call of repentance. And so I felt this was uh, very vital and important to our understanding. As we look to the glory and the majesty of his image and, and of who he is, uh, he deals with a couple of things in that, including the ethical image of God's holiness. 
and how God is love, therefore he is also holy. In page 13 he writes, His mercy is fulfilled of the love of God in harmony with justice. His power is not the power to do anything, but to do all things perfectly, or could we say holy, in love. What a beautiful description of that. Pentecostally, we often speak of the power of God and the majesty and the glory of that power that God can do anything. But Goss really refines that, refines that into a deeper understanding by saying that this power that God has, which is unlimited, is not just to do anything, but that he does all things perfectly or wholly through love. Wow, isn't that beautiful? And so uh, as we again are being invited into a repentant heart that we would walk holy and righteous before the Lord, it's not just this desire to do it all right that we can do anything right, but rather to walk perfectly or holy through love just as our Creator in His image. Um, another phrase he uses that stood out to me and, and I appreciated uh, is it referenced a few times and he speaks of stewardship. Uh, often when we think of stewardship, particularly when we start looking into the local church, we think of it financially, we think of it maybe with property or the things we own, and maybe even with our time. And those are great uh, ways to look at stewardship. But Goss speaks about having the stewardship of God's holiness, that God has saved us, that he has forgiven us, and with a repentant heart, that he is placing his image, created in the image of God, that that stewardship of God's image that we've been created in is to be one that is steward to live holy. And I thought what a, a different way that many times that we often have communicated this walk of holiness uh, is that we're created in the image of God and to steward that image that God has created. Again, not that we are gods, but, but that in his image we have been given that. We should steward also the image in his holiness, in his perfection, and in love and all of these things. Um, he says, if a stewardship is a stewardship of moral perfection, page 15. And this stewardship is all of us, our complete wholeness uh, to, to walk before him in this uh, uh, holy and righteous. Also, he writes um, around page 16 when speaking of the stewardship of holiness, that it is not simply a removing of evil, but rather a fulfillment, and I quote, of harmony, peace, love, obedience, and purity. Again, page 16. This stewardship of holiness is, is another way for us to grab hold of this call of repentance to live holy and righteous before the Lord. Holiness is simply a reflection of God's love in us flowing outwardly. Our walking is in holiness is likewise a reflection of God, His love from us or from Him to us and to the world. And so we have that opportunity to walk in holiness as an example and an ambassador of Christ. Uh, he speaks of some things that uh, I, I won't get into depth on for, for time in this video, but he speaks about the sinfulness of humanity, uh, three aspects. Uh, I encourage you to take a closer look at that. Uh, one of the questions kind of deals in part with that. Uh, this is a powerful Wesleyan theological principle of salvation, and so um, it, it is something distinctive um, in many of our circles in Wesleyan Pentecostalism, and so it helps you understand that. So maybe you can get a better understanding as you read through that and a ways to communicate that. Um, also, he speaks of a repentance in mind, body, and spirit. Uh, I think this is important, particularly for us in a Pentecostal uh, Wesleyan setting is oftentimes we can be labeled, uh, self-labeled or externally labeled and maybe even walk in a theolo theology of spirit alone uh, because we're so experiential in, in the experience of the Holy Spirit, the emotion and the, the, those feelings. But he speaks of a repentance not only in a spiritual context to the soul, but into the mind and body. Specifically, he states it this way on page 22. Repentance is a work of God's grace in the whole person. Mind, emotions, and will uh, is how he defines those. But we often hear mind, body, spirit. This will is specific to his writing in, in how our will is adapted through repentance as well. Repentance is simply deeper or more complete than just a spiritual act. It is of our whole person, uh, whichever phraseology you prefer, but it is of a whole person. And again, I think this is important as we look to uh, a proper balance, not only in theology, but in our own Pentecostal tradition, that we see how God's holiness and his call of repentance affects every part of our life, our whole person, our whole body. 
another phrase he uses throughout his writing that is uh, uh, wonderful as well is this agency of word and spirit. The agency of word and spirit of God. And so he uses this, that it is this partnership of the word and of the spirit. And so again, if you look in broader theology, you see heavier concentrations maybe to word or to spirit. But he continues to speak about it is the partnership of the word and spirit that bring about these as, and he used the word agents. And I love that, that phrase. But together they combine to help create formations of holiness from uh, beginning in acts of repentance, both through the Spirit's calling and the washing of the Word. Uh, these are core foundations to uh, understanding. Uh, one of the overarching themes that I think is so vital that we grab in this chapter, a lot of details, some of which I have covered, is that a core foundation of discipleship, the purpose of our course together, revolves in a heart of repentance and a lifestyle of repentance. He writes on page 25, The full meaning of repentance then requires a change of direction in the heart, mind, and will. If we do not have individually and if we do not lead and properly uh, bring about leading people through discipleship by beginning in a repentant heart, mind, body, and will, as he writes, or heart, mind, and will, then we miss the opportunity to properly lead them in discipleship. A discipleship is a turning and a changing of one life to follow Christ in many respects. But if that doesn't begin first through repentance, we miss the entire process. And maybe, just as my own personal thought, maybe we miss some theology of repentance and practical theology of it in our churches and in our teaching that we've often missed maybe discipleship from the foundational element of lacking in repentance. And of course, uh, repentance is more in, in teaching and us doing a, to a practical level, practical ministry better through teaching and, and helping people in repentance is more than good sermons. It is how do we live this out? How do you in your church, let me ask you this, and again, maybe if we were in a classroom setting, we could dialogue here. How do we practice not only teaching it from a pulpit, but practice repentant lifestyles? And how do we incorporate that in our proper discipleship uh, activity, but more than a class, but in lives. How do we live that out? I think that's a great uh, thought for you to think on and, and to look at. Uh, repentance is a requirement, uh, and, and it must be based in change, changing from not only the old sinful person to remove sin, but uh, truly being changed from the image we are until the image of our Creator, again, created in His image. Um, and so uh, I encourage you as you read through this, and as you think through repentance, let it be more than a theological term or even a phrase to draw someone in a moment of prayer of salvation, but something we take beyond preaching and we maybe even look in how we can bring reformation to our practical modern theology and, and apply it to our process of discipleship. Uh, we must, I believe, take that deeper, more than forgiveness of sin but it's an invitation to walk with God and take upon his character and his nature made in his likeness. Uh, and I believe this repentance is a great foundation for us to build upon in discipleship. Now, as you uh, complete this, we will look into our other book uh, and I'll take just a few minutes with it. It is three chapters. Um, in chapter one, he discusses why discipleship uh, and, and again, not trying to review the entirety of it with us, um, but he speaks of defining a disciple. Uh, it's fairly brief, but I encourage you to give great thought in defining what a disciple is and why we are called to be disciples. Um, without a story, I will tell you we have people sitting in churches today that at times question if everyone sitting under the sound of the voice of the minister is called to be a disciple? Uh, is every Christian called to be a disciple? And if so, what does that mean? Uh, Blevins and uh, Maddox speaks of some definition and some elements of that, but I encourage you to give thought to that because uh, what that means, if we don't feel that God has called us there and we don't understand what it is, it's hard to become one uh, and it's hard to pursue that. And so I encourage you to think through uh, and read through that, knowing that we're all called to become a disciple and a proper understanding of that again, begins our journey. I uh, speak somewhat of the uh, Wesleyan tradition of discipleship and the need for, as he defines it, Christian education, the lack of it and how that is adapted throughout time. And he compares through some elements of history. 
He writes in one place in uh, page 22, uh, rediscovering of a relevant theology will bridge the gap between content and method. What a powerful statement. Uh, we must have theology. That is a proper study of, of Scripture and the Word of God. And, uh, but he uses the word relevant theology. It must be something that's relevant, um, not just in a classroom, but it's, again, a part of this class, very practical into the life. But notice he doesn't just say a practical theology, but he says a practical theology will become the bridge that will gap between content and method. Sometimes as you study forms of discipleship, you will find those with great content phenomenal and we look at it and go that church that organization they should produce the world's best disciples because they have phenomenal content and that's a part of it but he also speaks of those with method and method is another aspect of it and through relevant theology he says we will be able to bridge the gap between content great content and also having relevant i will add methods into our context into our culture that we each minister to so that we can produce disciples. We do not have to choose between having good con content or having a proper method. We can have both. Uh, that's encouraging to hear as he writes that, and he says proper, relevant, and rediscovering even adds proper, relevant theology as a part of that. Um, the sad truth is, as he writes, pastors and Christians, ed educators, or we could say leaders, place a strong emphasis on teaching and preaching a holiness message, but listen to this, but we are unable to see the impact of holiness on their practical ministries. And if, again, we could sit in dialogue on this for a few moments. I think all of us would have a story, and some of us may have ministries that feel laden by this, that we have preached and we've taught. And if we did a study, it would be great content. Uh, but yet if we looked at the practical ministry, we would see oftentimes a lack of impact into leading people in discipleship and walking holy um, because maybe we've missed something. And that, that is sad, uh, but it is also a part of our exploration here that we can not only have great preaching, not only that we have great teaching, but that our practical ministries would be impacted. And then what that really means is that the kingdom of God would be impacted in process. And I know that's each of our hearts as we uh, come through this process together. Um, and it also takes some pressure off of us as those that stand in pulpits and on podiums to teach or preach is that our teaching and preaching is not the beginning and the end of practical ministry. And it certainly is not the beginning and the end of discipleship. It's a part of it, but it is not the entirety. Um, another phrase that he uses uh, in this first chapter is, is that he speaks that we do not have to divorce our practice or our activity from our theology. Uh, again, a part of this this content versus method could also be described as activity versus theology uh, or practice versus theology as if um, the those that study theology are not practitioners. In my introduction to you, I use that word. Uh, we Most everyone that is in this class is a practitioner first. We are practicing our theology, and so we don't have to. We can have academia, education, help, and assistance, and learning and growing theologically but also very practically. They do not have to be divorced. And I encourage you, as you let the Lord lead you in your studies, wherever you're at in your journey, that you ask him to help you stay focused in that, that you not veer too far and, and miss the practical nature he's leading you into the ministry that you have. Um, a brief note, it'll be discussed later, but as he concludes chapter one, he talks briefly about small groups in, in our modern, particularly American church. This has become a very pop culture um, phrase and it is something that um, that we see a lot written about we see a lot that is discussed regarding uh, small groups and note that he distinguishes this going back to the 18th century that um, John Wesley this was a core element of his discipleship and he writes uh, Blevins and Maddox uh, writes on page 24 Wesley, uh, Wesley's system of group formation is distinctive and was the primary basis for the success of Methodism. And so if we look into our own tradition within the Church of God of Prophecy, we can see small group formation, band groups, other languages we use as being a primary basis of growth, of discipleship, and other things. And so as we jump ahead into chapter 3, which is a historical account um, of, of some of these, through, as he titles it, through the centuries, um, 
I want you to keep that in mind, not just in the element of small groups, but the principle of, of that chapter is he does a very quick but thorough review of his history regarding discipleship, how people viewed it, what the goal was, the objective, and he has these categories. And so I encourage you to read that thoroughly and, and really process that with the idea that we're going to mine principles from each area area and we're going to learn from it not to uh, replicate it for the sake of repetition but rather that we gain in wisdom and understanding from each of those and sadly we fail at that many times also notice note in that chapter and i know i skipped chapter two but he talks about three approaches to history um, and each of these phases that he deals with uh, are are very true and we can look in our own movement uh, if you've been in our movement any length of time you've seen the romantic as he defines it stage where where we um, idolize to some degree that and there's a reason there and he talks about that then there's the honest assessment of that and how that comes about uh, then there is the third phase or stage of that where we're able to bring application he says uh, in page 42 all historical studies should invoke three these stages of respect understanding and application and that's really what we want to arrive as we review our own history and the history beginning in the Old Testament as he writes through the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the early church all the way into the modern and contemporary churches of today. Uh, some might add a, a more recent term from even the writing. But each of these, there are principles we can learn and that we can gain from and we can pull from. So I encourage us to have respect understanding and also application as we read all three of those uh, it will be a value to you um, as you look to those latter two phases i encourage you to really look in your local church uh, look into your ministry over the years and see the shifting of times and how we can see the emergence of of the modern church into the contemporary and these shiftings from uh, what some would call a congregational to an individual mindset in our culture that has affected how we do discipleship locally. And we see that shift in that. Some would even call it the self-centered nature, particularly of the North American uh, region, and how we can see that affecting the models of discipleship. Uh, we also see that in that the rise of experiential Christianity. Uh, many of us grew up with that, this personal experience uh, and what we feel, what we experience as opposed to what he moves into in the contemporary church um, and, and how he sees that. And as I enjoyed his reading, uh, particularly into the contemporary church, he says this about it. Uh, we'll explore new modes of discipleship and leadership development that empower people to live out the gospel in local and global communities as the church. And to me, that's an encouragement as we look to the modern, uh, or excuse me, to the contemporary church is that he doesn't say that we're going to explore doing inside the church. He says that it will not be in the church house, but as the church, and that we will not be inside the house, but yet that this will be in the local and global communities. And so he really looks at this paradigm of it shifting what I would call an event focus mindset, the experiential, to living it out outside of the church house. And this is very holistic and again, very exciting and, and very hopeful in our world as we see that. And he, he does a great job of that. Of course, chapter two that I, I skipped is a wonderful chapter as well uh, that in its own right could have its own lecture. But he talks about the story of God. Um, you need to read this uh, if you haven't. Um, but this story of God really revolves around echoing a principle that I, I love and believe in, which is that the word of God is more than a list of rules and regulations. It speaks to the very heart and character of God. I've told people by reading the word of God, it is not teaching me the list of do's and don'ts, but rather it lets me know my father. And I think as we look to discipleship and the invitation of our heavenly father to come into his story and to learn him and to grow with him and to understand him, it's more than theological. It's more than, than a class. It is an engagement with our creator, understanding him and his majesty and in his glory uh, and his, all of his characteristics. And so um, this is powerful. In, in uh, page 29, he says, while scripture serves many different functions, the content of the Bible is a narrative or story leading readers to understand the nature of God and God's actions on behalf of creation, including humanity. And so uh, I think this is a great uh, way to end our lecture. 
as we begin to look at the story of God through his scripture and seeing him and inviting people into that story with us as a part of it. And as we look to the practical ministry, the question becomes, as you read these things, is not just the intellectual awakening that hopefully it even applies into your heart, but what is the external application into your local church that you can learn from this? So as we come to our assignments for the week, let me give you those for the next two minutes. As you begin your weekly assignments, again, you have your weekly journal. Uh, again, as I said previous, the syllabus states that you use Goss's writing to write your two-page journal. I am asking you to expand that to both readings because there is in both books a biblical theological concept and a practical one. And I want you to hone in, not a summary. This is, not, again, not a summary. This is what is it that you pulled from it, and I want you to engage in the text. And what I mean by engaging with the text is the text is information. Now, what is your understanding, and what is it you have learned from it that you can bring application to it? If you have questions about that, please reach out to me. But this will help you in learning and pulling information. Your educational endeavors will feed you all kind of information, but through discernment of the Spirit, through where God has placed you, you're going to pull those things, gain understanding, and then from that bring application from it. Uh, so I encourage you to include both, I ask you to include both of those. Uh, do not get any uh, length here, just if you have to go over into the early part of the third page, that's fine, but this is not to be a lengthy, this is a journal entry that shows you're engaging with the text, that you're having thoughts. This is really your personal thoughts uh, that God is speaking to you and you're gaining from uh, from the reading that we have. Uh, also, you're going to have a discussion. Those questions are several that are there. Uh, I'm asking you to pick two of those. One uh, really from each book. If you feel really moved to do two from one book, that is fine. But again, once again, this is about having a discussion as a class, uh, as we're sitting together and you saying something to the effect of when I read this statement in the book, this question uh, that you've posed really came out to me, and you begin to engage with your thoughts using the references of the books, as well as not only the lecture, but, but more importantly, what uh, your learning is. And if you have other sources, bring them in. Uh, again, there is a um, uh, range of writing length. Uh, this is a discussion, not a dissertation. So uh, keep it at that so that all of the students and myself are able to really engage with it. Uh, and then remember that you will pick uh, at least two by the end of the week that you will respond to to, again, create a two-way conversation. Um, lastly, remember, do not reiterate or summarize the book in any of your writing. We've read those. I want you to engage. I just keep using that word. I want you to do that. Uh, if you have to use or choose to use an illustration or a story, remember, keep that brief because none of these writings are extremely lengthy. Uh, if you make them too lengthy of a story or an illustration, uh, the bulk of your writing will be that illustration and you will miss the engagement of the text with it. Um, I hope in the, all of your writing, each of these assignments, my goal is to grade you and to assist you that you're able to see um, and we're able to see how the text, these principles, these ideas, both theologically and practically, historically and currently, are forming and reforming you and your thoughts and your ability to engage and analyze the material to put into practice what God would have us do. Remember, the Word of God moves us into engaging into our world, the culture and context, and coming into the local church to become the, the mechanism to engage that and how that just continues to move. So uh, if you have any questions, reach out and ask me. Again, I will be available. We'll be begin grading over the weekend uh, your, your assignments um, that you have, and so hopefully you'll have those early uh, next week. And so, again, thank you so much for your time. God bless you, and uh, welcome to week one.